Praise the Lord, saints of God. You know, thousands of individuals around the world have gladly welcomed my encouraging messages. However, there are still many who are wondering, who is Brent Winfield? Well, this little video serves to reveal some details. I'm the publisher and editor of the Advent Message, and I'm also the head elder in my local Seventh-day Adventist church congregation. See, friend, God has called me to full-time ministry. The Advent Message ministry has, by God's grace, seen tremendous growth over the past few years. The YouTube ministry channel, for example, has, of today, 12,300 subscribers along with 1.8 million views. The Facebook ministry currently has three vibrant groups. One group has recently surpassed the mark of 12,000 members, and the Advent Message also conducts ministries on Instagram and WhatsApp. Even though this has been a lot of work, as you can well imagine, it all comes down to the fact that the Three Angels Message is being promulgated throughout the world. I invite you to play a vital role in the spreading of this gospel message with your prayerful donations. Now if after watching this video you feel impressed to assist in the furthering of God's Word to every corner of the globe, then I invite you to make a donation to this ministry. You may use PayPal to make the donation by using my email address. Brentwinfield at gmail.com. So as you can see by the Lord's grace, I seek to prepare all people, particularly Seventh-day Adventists, to be ready for Christ's soon return. Now please note, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, not an Adventist. You see, an Adventist is any Christian who is looking for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. But I am much, much more than that. Friend, I made a rational and intelligent decision to become a Seventh-day Adventist about 50 years ago. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist by birth. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist by choice. I often admire those of you who were born into a Seventh-day Adventist family. There are others like myself, though, who, as newly baptized members, who as rational adults, I've made a clear, thinking, intelligent decision to join the Remnant Church. By the way, this is not a church, it's a movement. It's been termed a movement since the year 1844, when our pioneers were called by God's grace to proclaim the Three Angels' message. But why am I telling you this? I'm saying this to you so that you can have a different perspective on worshiping the God of creation. Sure, you've been told the reasons to worship God include the fact that He made our world, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 Or maybe you worship God because He has blessed you physically, financially, or maybe you have been blessed with a wonderful family. But like all of us, you worship the Father because He sent His only Son to die on the cross for our sins. Now, I want to give you another reason for worshiping God. Now, this reason is different from your usual thinking. One of the main reasons why we choose to worship Almighty God can be summed up in the fact that you're here. The only reason you're here is by the grace of the living God who created you before you were even born. Friend, the reason you're here is because you won. You won the race. You are a winner, and I can prove it to you. Now follow me now, as I show you proof that you're a winner. Imagine that you're in a race, like the annual New York City Marathon, where there are thousands of other well-trained athletes participating, right? The gun goes off and everyone is jockeying for position. You have been training for years for this moment, and now you're determined to finish in the top 10. But as you huff and puff along, you suddenly realize at the halfway mark of the race, 
you find yourself in the leading bunch. Then as the race nears completion, you had moved up to the third position. A spark of joy was ignited and you called upon your last remaining strength and moved up beside the world champion. Now this world champion had won gold medals at the last Olympic Games. So he's not to be taken lightly. But this is the race where only one can be crowned a champion. There you are, neck and neck with the Olympic champ. And just at the last minute, you find an extra burst of speed and you break the finish line at the final hundredth of a second ahead of everyone else. You won, you won, you won. Well, friend, in human biological terms, during a romantic moment between a husband and a wife, the man releases thousands of tiny microscopic little spermatosa that are all in a race swimming like crazy towards the finishing line of the ovary of the female. The spermatosa all look alike and they're all equal in size and are all equally healthy little organisms. However, you are the only one who has been ordained by God from the beginning from the creation of the world to win that race. Imagine God has chosen you from thousands of other possibilities. Isn't that marvelous, friend? Now, are you beginning to see why you need to praise and thank the Almighty God? Only one sperm can fertilize that egg, and that sperm was you. Only one beautiful God-given spermatosa out of all the thousands that were released is able to be the winner and fertilize that ovary egg, thereby making a beautiful baby, which is now you. And that's why you're here. And that's why you need to praise and thank the Holy God who made not only heaven and earth, but He personally made you. Well, yeah, I became a Seventh-day Adventist because I was chosen before I was even born to show forth the praise of the living God. Now, don't get me wrong, throughout the world there are thousands upon thousands of true Christians who worship God to the best of their ability. Oh, I sincerely believe that all these individuals have each been blessed by the Lord as they worship with a sincere heart. God has His children in every denomination. While I do believe that God has raised up this remnant church to proclaim His urgent three angels message for the last days, Seventh-day Adventists are by no means an exclusive club. Friend, we believe that Christ died for all and that, quote, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2. I love God and have made a conscious, intelligent decision to make His Son, Jesus Christ, Lord of my life. Like I said a little earlier, I was not born a Seventh-day Adventist. Matter of fact, I was officially brought up to be an Anglican. I love being an Anglican choir boy, for I got to wear the cassock and surplice robe, which was somewhat similar to the robes the priests wore. But at about 12 years ago, 12 years of age, I should say, 12 years I, as I went about my duties, assisting the priest and administering the sacrament, Two things always bothered me. First, each time I entered that Anglican church, as do all the other worshippers, I was forced to bow and make the sign of the cross to a giant statue of Jesus, which practically filled the entire back area of the altar. Even as a 12-year-old, I recall reading part of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, which states, Thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. Well, this really bothered me. I knew even back then that I was breaking God's commandment by bowing down to this lifeless statue, even though it was purported to be a representation of Jesus Christ. Secondly, when I became older, another aspect of the Ten Commandments bothered me. The Bible clearly stated that the seventh day of the is the Sabbath of the Lord. 
I reason that since everyone acknowledged that the week began on Sunday, well, then it logically followed that, I said that Saturday was God's true Sabbath and not Sunday. So why then is everyone worshiping on the wrong day, Sunday? Now at that time I was just a teenager, okay? So I mentally shrugged it off, figuring there must be some reasonable explanation as to why Sunday is revered by everyone in my community. Remember, I was not yet a Seventh-day Adventist when these thoughts entered my head. Oh Lord, oh Lord, did I ever know at the time that God was preparing me to honor His commandments, all ten of them. The Lord led me to a church that placed top priority on not only teaching and preaching salvation by the grace of Jesus Christ, but the church also taught the keeping of God's eternal Ten Commandments, all ten of them, including His Holy Sabbath day. Well, my baptism was the beginning of a marvelous journey of discovery of Bible truth. Isn't it wonderful, friend, how the Lord can place our feet onto His pathway of righteousness with just one or two discovery of present truth? Today, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because of the Seventh-day Sabbath. As much as I love, embrace, and practice true Sabbath-keeping. See, there are approximately 495 different organizations worldwide that now keep the true Seventh-day Sabbath. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church is much more than Sabbath-keeping. Much, much more. You know, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because of the fact we operate thousands of hospitals and schools all around the world. We operate the largest church school system in the world, after the Catholics. Seventh-day Adventists are globally well known for the marvelous work that they do in health and education. For example, ADRA is a worldwide Adventist organization that is highly respected in providing emergency relief wherever needed. Other than the Catholic Church, we are known to operate the finest hospitals in the world. No friend, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because of our marvelous schools and hospitals and global relief agency. Also, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because we're the fastest growing denomination in the world. In just a few years, we have grown by millions. Today, there are more than 25 million Seventh-day Adventists in most countries of the world. See, the main reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist today can be broken down into the seven main pillars of the church. These seven pillars were first established by our church pioneers back in the mid-1800s. And these seven pillars are the firm foundation of our denomination. You don't know what a pillar is, don't you? A pillar is a main upright block of solid concrete that upholds the building. Pillars are extremely important because if you do away with any one of them, you'll be in danger of the building crashing down upon you. So I urge you, dear saint of God, to keep these seven pillars of your beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church upright. Don't ever one tell you, anyone tell you that they're not needed. These pillars are all strongly based upon the Word of God and were carefully crafted by our pioneers with much prayer and Bible study. So, with that understanding of the vital importance of the pillars, let's take a look at each of them. Pillar number one, the law of God. A controversy began in heaven between God and Satan concerning God's law. The devil accused the Lord that his laws are impossible to be perfectly kept. That controversy rages today despite the fact that the life of Jesus vindicated the Father. We humans are caught right in the middle of this great controversy. And it's all about whether or not the law can be kept by us. The three angels' messages found in the book of Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 12 
beautifully highlight the importance of God's holy law. Those messages found reflect how serious God is regarding all ten of his laws, not just the seventh-day Sabbath. Papal Rome, which is represented by the Revelation, by the beast of Revelation 13, 14, discourages the world to keep God's law and adopt man-made laws. Seventh day Adventists are called to expose the beast's false teachings of disobedience and idol worship. The law of God is eternal, friend. The law of God is a transcript of his character. The law of God is love in action. Now, I believe that when any denomination that teaches that the law has been done away with is a gross misrepresentation of Bible doctrine. Pillar number two, sanctuary message. The Seventh Adventist Church is the only denomination in Christianity that truly embraces and teaches doctrine of the sanctuary. Now this is strange to me because Christ is clearly depicted throughout the imagery of the wilderness and the heavenly sanctuary messages. Any cursory examination of the sanctuary as depicted in the books of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Hebrews in the New Testament illustrates the seriousness of how God views sin. It explains in graphic detail his abhorrence of the sin, his enduring love for the sinner, and his solution for the permanent eradication of sin. A study of the sanctuary, both the Old and the New Testaments, will rekindle a love for Christ like nothing else can. Why do other Christians ignore the wonderful truths found inside God's sanctuary? We should read and reread and study the wonderful sanctuary truths that are embedded inside the books of Leviticus and Hebrews. Pillar number three, victory over sin. Once again, here is a doctrine that is widely misunderstood by the global Christian community. Most are taught that we will be sinning until Jesus returns or until we rapture. This is simply not true, my friend. Some of the Adventist Christians believe that it is possible to gain the victory over sin and live a sinless life. Through the indwelling power of Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit. God is looking for a pure and holy church without one spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The Bible is replete with scripture texts that teach this vital doctrine. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48 Again, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or any wrinkle or any such thing, but it shall be holy and without blemish. See Ephesians 5.27 Quote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service." End quote. Romans 12, 1. God is saying that what he's asking of us is reasonable. Again, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? End quote. 1 Corinthians 15. Can sin live in a temple, friend, where God dwells? Of course not. Only through the power of Christ can we live sin-free. I believe I can do all things, not some things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ in me enables me to live without sinning. Pillar number four, the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 12, 17 immediately separates the Seventh Adventist Church from the rest of the world by stating, and I quote, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her sea, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ." End quote. How many churches keep all of God's commandments? Most churches teach that the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross. Not so, my friend. Then the scriptural passage goes on to say, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
To gain an insight into what the testimony of Jesus Christ means, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation 19.10, which tells us to, quote, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, end quote. It's a clear identifying mark of what the remnant church has, spirit of prophecy. We believe that God poured out his spirit into the writings and teachings of Ellen G. White. We feel that the Bible, which is our rule of faith, makes it plain that God has provided his church with a genuine prophet. The Bible is the greater light, and the writings of Ellen White is the lesser light that guides this church. A cursory study of our hundreds of manuscripts will leave no doubt in the mind of the reader that this was a woman who was specifically raised up to counsel God's remnant church in the final conflict. Well, pillar number five, the health message. This quotation from the pen of inspiration captures the essence of the Adventist health message. I quote, The physical life is to be carefully educated, cultivated, and developed, that through men and women, the divine nature may be revealed in its fullness. Both the physical and the mental powers, with the affectations, are to be so trained that they can reach the highest efficiency. Perfection of character cannot be attained when the laws of nature are disregarded, for this is the transgression of the law of God. His law is written by his own finger upon every nerve, every muscle, every fiber of our being, upon every faculty which has been entrusted to man. These gifts are bestowed not to be abused and corrupted, but to be used to his honor and glory in the uplifting of humanity." End quote. And let the church say, Amen. Pillar number six, the state of the dead. A major seven Adventist church doctrine espouses that the dead are merely asleep. When someone dies, they are asleep in the grave. Biblically, there is no such thing as the dead immediately ascending to heaven, hell, or purgatory. When you're dead, you're dead, period. The Bible teaches that there will come a time when the dead in Christ shall rise first. The wicked dead will be judged at a later date. But whether someone dies in Christ or outside of Christ, they're asleep in the grave and not floating around somewhere in in a ghost-like body. Almost the whole world, in both Christian and non-Christian, have accepted the devil's lie found in Genesis 3-4 regarding the fact that death is not really death. The doctrine of the immortality of the soul have paved the way for spirits of devils to impersonate the dead and deceive many people. This same doctrine is a teaching of the New Age movement as it brings Eastern mysticism to the West. Only as we understand the Bible teaching on this subject are we able to effectively warn men and women concerning the deceptions of spirits of devils, working miracles, and impersonating dead people. Pillar number seven, righteousness by faith. True righteousness by faith involves a word that is rarely used in the wider Christian community. And that word, friend, is obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. Having faith in Jesus Christ means nothing without obeying the commands of Jesus Christ. We embrace the Christian teaching of righteousness by faith, but with the added biblical teaching of obedience to God's laws. Quote, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. End quote. Friend, this has nothing to do with legalism, but it has everything to do with love. Indescribable love that cannot be bought or repaid still needs to have a display of affection and appreciation. The highest form of showing appreciation is by demonstrating love. That is implicit to obey the giver of that love. 
And this is why so many Adventists believe that God's Ten Commandments law is an expression of His character. As the psalmist says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So, friend, in conclusion, I made a conscious decision to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church first and foremost because I love Jesus Christ and have made him Lord of my life. <clears throat> but I'm also a Seventh-day Adventist who is part of a movement that declares the three angels' messages. This movement is calling honest-hearted people everywhere to come out of Babylon and to get ready for the greatest event known to man, the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those of you who are not yet baptized into the Seventh Adventist Church, I invite you to investigate the doctrines, investigate the standards of this biblically sound church. And then I invite you to become a part of this great movement, which declares to a dying world the love of God and the soon return of his son Jesus Christ to take his faithful children home. Now this brings us back to why we worship God. We worship him because we love him. We love him because he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We worship him because after listening to his words today, you now have the truth. The truth shall set you free. Friend, I implore you, be free. Let us pray. Father in heaven, through your Holy Spirit, you have set out in detail the advantages of being a part of your remnant church. Personally, I did not join this church because of Sabbath keeping, as important as that is. I joined this church because I love Jesus Christ and wishes to obey him in every aspect of my being, including the keeping of all ten of his commandments. I can only do so through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So Lord bless me, but not only me Lord, all those who hear these words issuing from my lips, motivated by your Holy Spirit, and encourage all who hear to lay their hearts at your feet and come into the remnant church. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for blessing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's all for today, friend. Always remember, God loves you. Yes, he really, really does love you.